Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have Dr. Lori today on our show. Dr. Lori is a Harvard Medical School, school graduate who has practiced both emergency medicine and psychiatry, and he has studied genetics at John Hopkins um, and Harvard and, he, and the Pasteur Institute in Paris. He was also exposed to um, seminars led by four Nobel Prize winners, two who discovered the structure of DNA and two who discovered mRNA. And today he has a lot of information he wants to go over. So he, he has a sequence that he wants to begin with so you understand the whole meaning and the whole synopsis of what he's trying to get across. So before I say anything else, I'm going to let Dr. Lurie take over. So Dr. Lurie, tell everybody about yourself and what you do. And it's been a, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Okay. Well, it's really a pleasure to be here. It really is. About myself. Well, I think you hit the highlights right there, at least in terms of what's relevant to discussion today. So here's, here's what my goal was. My goal was to get deeper than psychology, deeper than the unconscious, something I know about as a psychiatrist, and really get down to the genetics of what we're all about. Right. Because I thought that that's the only way we can kind of work backwards and see what's going on today, especially in politics, really in society. Right. Politics reflects what's going on in society, and it certainly is doing that now. So basically, um, I didn't know where to start. But um, I thought, thought I'd start with the basics of life, survival and reproduction. Mm -hmm. Well, survival is pretty obvious, but every creature, every one of us, plants too, have to have a way to reproduce or else right. the species dies out. Mm -hmm. So I started yeah. with that. Then, because humans are pretty complicated, we have this overlay of culture that kind of obscures everything. I thought I'd look for a lower species that doesn't have culture that just has genes that transmits behavior from one generation to the next. And basically I came up with birds. Birds reproduce in a nest. We produce in a nest, in a house. We call it the nest sometimes. Birds feed their very vulnerable offspring through transferring adult food into food that an offspring can digest. Birds do it by taking the food into their mouth, and then digesting it partially, and then giving it to their offspring. We do it because the mother transfers adult food to the baby via her breast. Mm -hmm. And that's those are the similarities that I thought were strong. Right. Okay. Well, when then when you look at survival, all creatures, birds in particular, so um, what they do is they're out in the wild and they're just uh, gathering food and other essential resources, and they're protecting themselves against danger. Pretty obvious. Mm -hmm. Reproduction comes into the picture. Those survival functions, they're then focused on the nest, focused on the family, the offspring and the mate. And by the way, you'll see that this might sound like it's gender focused. Gender is irrelevant as we can, as we know in our society now, it's really yeah. become clear that it's irrelevant. And in fact, in birds, there's some species where the male even broods the eggs and then raises the offspring while the female goes out and brings in food. Right. But really, that's really it. The survival functions have to do with outside the nest behavior, which are to gather food, bring it into the nest and protect the nest against would be intruders, protecting by attacking them, by dive bombing them. And I have to tell you something, did a lot of research on this. But there's nothing like real life experience. Yes. One day, I got a little too close to a robin's nest. How did I know this? Well, I heard chirping. But then this seemingly huge robin comes right at my face. Oh, and my I God. swatted away three or four times. It kept coming after me. Little bird, big human, didn't matter. Do anything to protect that nest. Finally, I just backed off and that was the end of it. But it's yeah. nothing like real life experience to bring it home. Right. Inside the nest, the desire to maximize the number of offspring, which is the same as same ha as happens outside the nest, but it's done in a different way. Inside the nest, every offspring that's survivable has to survive. It doesn't matter if one of those is stronger or weaker, victim or victorious, right. meritorious or not. It doesn't matter. And if you think, if you think, think in humans, it happens too. You'll yeah. see parents who talk, who say their children who are criminals are really good boys. 
because this is really programmed into birds, programmed to all of us to make the next generation happen. Right. So we have these two kinds of behaviors outside the nest, survival, inside the nest, reproduction. Another very important thing that happens inside the nest is the drive to take care of the most vulnerable at the time. Mm. Think of it. If that weren't programmed into us, into birds, into us, if that weren't programmed in, then we wouldn't take care of the most vulnerable at the time. Right. So her has an infant in her arm and a toddler falls down and is bleeding. Well, she's got a dilemma. She's got to somehow figure out how to take get, uh, put that infant down and take care of the one that's bleeding. Right. Okay. That sets the stage. The question then is how is this reflected in humans? Because we're so darn complicated, it's hard to see one thing from another. Right. Take the first thing, gathering food for the nest. Well, we gather money. It's better than just gathering food because we can use it now. We can use it later. Right. We also don't like intruders to come into our nest. We have police that keep intruders out of our home. And we have military that keep would-be intruders out of our country. Right. These things are pretty basic, pretty basic. Now, let's talk about what happens inside the nest, because that's really what's not that recognized. What I've talked about so far about outside the nest, it's pretty superficial. I'll just put it in there for reference. Right. What's inside the nest is translated into our world in different ways. For example, we say Americans like the underdog. Well, when you get close to one-on-one, -on -one, everybody likes the underdog. Everybody takes care of the most vulnerable. Yeah. It's really into us. If you think of charities, good charities, they don't send around uh, flyers with a whole bunch of starving kids. No, one starving, pleading face. And it, it, that hearts go out to that child and often we will give some money to that charity. Right. But it's using this innate, genetically determined drive of ours to take care of the most vulnerable. Again, if we didn't take care of the most vulnerable, then the most vulnerable would die. We wouldn't have many people left. Right. Or people left. All right. So now how does this translate into society now and into civilizations? So let's look at the issues in politics that are going on. Mm -hmm. We have the issue of immigration. That's a big issue today. Yes. We have the issue of law and order. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the economy, jobs. Yes. These tend to clump under what we call conservative or Republican. You can call them what you want. They're determined by basic underlying genetic drives. Mm -hmm. The other group of, of, um, of uh, issues has to do with uh, feeding the poor, welfare. Uh, it doesn't care about Im immigration because remember, it's the outside the nest that cares about keeping it free of would-be intruders. It's just not the job inside the nest. And so people that kind of are more, let's call them more left or liberal, yeah, they is disturbed about just the idea of immigration. They're okay with it. Uh, taking care of the vulnerable, we talked about that, welfare. So we can leave it at that and I'll bring in more, more, more examples if we have to. Right we see happening here so what's different so the political parties in the past had to do with national issues versus states remember way back in the beginning of this country right other huge one was slavery or not mm -hmm. country was torn about that got resolved what we're hap happening now is we're talking about survival and reproduction now you might not know this, but republics tend not to exist longer than 250 years. We're already a little past that. If you read about, if you read about civilization as written by anthropologists, mm -hmm. you don't have a clear-cut consensus in terms of what makes a civilization fall. For mm -hmm. example, if you say, well, this civilization had a drought and you know, therefore they fell apart, the anthropologists will say, well, you know. They probably had droughts before and they got over them. Right. Civilization, well, another civilization came and wiped them out. Well, 
they probably had trouble like that before and they got over it. They, they don't have a consensus. Different ones think different things, but they don't have a consensus on that. And if they don't have a consensus, there's not, they're not recognizing something. Right. And I think is that as a civilization secures survival, they're less focused on that and they become more focused on inside the nest, reproductive issues. Mm -hmm. Not unusual. You know, uh, I think it was Lewis and Clark or some of the explorers in America. Mm -hmm. Whoops. When they would when they would go out into the wild, once they secured themselves, they built a fort and then they deal with inside the nest behavior. They had their families would come out and they'd have kids and that would be their little civilization. Right. So the question is, is that what's going on in our country now, in our civilization now? Are we making this transition from survival now that we think it's really secure to the reproductive issues. And then of course, what happens is we fall prey, just like these other civilizations probably did. We fall prey, we forget about the survival issues and then we don't survive. Right. But this is what I think has to do with the fall of civilizations. And it's important to keep in mind because a lot of people are talking about that today. Yeah. It's coming different ways. People talk about that, what's happening to us. And if you think about it, we have had pretty secure life from, say, 1991, when the Cold War started. Right. Well, let's say that in 1990, the children who were 10 years old started to become politically aware. So from, 19, from 1990, 10-year-olds and up had, did, didn't really live with the fear of the atom bomb coming. Right. That's about society. That's a huge percentage of our society, about half. Yeah. And so, in, in, and what do you do about that? Well, I think the first thing to do is recognize it. If, if, you, if this seems to make sense to people, probably mm -hmm. refine, or maybe they add or subtract things from it, that's fine. Right. If it starts to make sense, then the question is, what do you do about it? I can offer my suggestions. Other people will offer theirs. We don't want to have a cold war again. Right. But, you know... It's hard to create a fear of survival. It's hard to create that. If that came, and it came a little bit in 9-11, if you remember. Yeah. All of a sudden, 9-11, everybody was hanging out flags. Remember, we all came together as a country. We were afraid of our yeah. survival. But there are no more 9-11s just like that. And we don't want 9-11s. We don't want yeah. Cold War. Mm -hmm. How do we do it? Yeah. Some committees will have to think about that. I, yeah. that's, a, that's pretty much as far as I can take it. I can go get into the details of it a little more. But, you know, it's one thing to be an academic and another to have to solve problems. Yeah. That in charge have to do. And, um, you know, if this if this makes a little bit of sense to them, they'll probably incorporate it into their thinking. But they have to think about this. They, they do. I see a huge change in our society, the behaviors of our society. And just in the, in the last decade, things have gotten, it seems worse and worse and worse, the behaviors of, of individuals and how they react and the level of hatred and 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 people um, hurting others. And then even if you, when you go back into politics, it is the same thing is happening. Instead of working together as a union, you have you have two sides. You know, uh, even even when you look at the Republicans, the Republicans are knocking heads with one another. They're not working together as a team, and you see the same thing going on on the other side. They're not they're not as unified as they could be. You know, they're worried about what the other side is doing and how can we knock them down. But then you have a whole society of people that need help in many different ways, and it's like you know. It, it just it the, our world doesn't seem unified to me. It seems more, you know, it just it's 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 uh, people don't have their perspectives in line. They don't have they don't they don't see the importance of, of of what should be prioritized and what should not be prioritized. And you know, I don't know if that's the fear of survival or if that is just ignorance in itself. You know, um, you know, uh, because we do have a lot of people who 
feel the need of power. They feel the need to feel recognized. And maybe that goes back to their roots of their childhood. Maybe they weren't recognized as a child. So now they is their time to thrive and prove themselves to themselves, you know, but it just seems like our world is kind of like in, in, in shambles. And I don't know, you know, if we, if we categorize that as, as, you know, a fear to survive, or if we, or if we look at it, you know, what do you, when you look at society and you look at politics and you look at the way politics has evolved in the last 10 years, you know, what's your perspective on it? The changes, the, the negative changes, especially. Well, it's horrid. I mean, um, I, I was around when, for example, Reagan and Tip O'Neill, Republican and Democrat, really cooperated. You really yeah. didn't hear much dissension. And now no. people look back at that and wonder why it can't happen again. There isn't the value on teamwork or cooperating. I think what you're talking about, people are kind of selfish about themselves. This one wants to be a leader of that one. If the value were on teamwork, there wouldn't be as much dissension within these groups. I'll call right. them groups of parties, political That's parties, but there, there wouldn't be dissension between the two big ones and in between in each of them. You know, it's like a it's like a family uh, where the, the parents argue. And uh, what's the sense in arguing? I mean, isn't a relationship more important? I mean, what right. are these superficial things we're arguing about? It's a basic yeah. relationship. It's important. Well, when there's balance in a family, that is when the outside the nest function, function yeah. because both parents could do the outside the nest and the inside the nest function. Right? Right. All these ideas we have. But when the outside the nest function isn't working well and the inside the nest function is demanding more you have an imbalance yes you have demands and dissension whatever when the outside the nest function is doing great lots of money whatever but inside the nest not really paying attention to their kids or whatever yeah it's an imbalance same thing exists in society if you have an imbalance you go from one to the other you know it's like a seesaw yeah if the democrats get in it's all the democratic stuff the Republicans get it. It's all Republican stuff. What about the American stuff? This yeah. is, we have to conceive of ourselves as a family. Right. We can start to think about balance. Both functions are fine. They're really essential. But they have to be in balance. I think that, that if that point is hammered home, people start to focus on that. And if that's the value, then teamwork and cooperation and compromise, those start to rise. And then the society can really get down to its what's going on without all the dissension that we're dealing with today. How do you get how do you get our societies, especially in the world of politics, to stop badgering each other and start cooperating with each other? What would be your suggestions? Because it just, you know, I, I will watch it, I listen to it. And it's it's sometimes it's very upsetting when you see where our society was 10, 20 years ago and you see where it is today. It seems more like a soap opera to me than it does an actual, you know, world of leadership and politics. And, and what kind of example are we are we setting for our future generation, the future Z generation when they see things like this going on? Do they even know what you know the right and the wrong way to behave? Who, you know, you, you have mentors in your home, but then you look at the world and you look at politics and you look at our, our union and you see how they behave. There's a cross message there. And it could be quite confusing to uh, young children who are developing and getting ready for the big world when they see behaviors like this exemplified in the professional world. Well, I think you're right. I think, uh, look, our leaders have to lead and show the next generation what the best way to function is. Yes, in the last 10, 20 years, there's been a gradual erosion of that. I think that, you know, it's been said that sunlight is the best antiseptic. Mm -hmm. I think that if this if this mentality, this, this, this desire for cooperation and balance is brought home, if it's picked up by the media, by other leaders in society, if that becomes the value, then we've got a chance right. getting together. You know, if the leaders can show as an example that they can cooperate, right? That's great. That's great. Even if the outcome isn't terrific, they've cooperated. Yeah, and that's the younger generation has to see that they can't be fighting each other because what did Lincoln say? A house divided against itself cannot survive. That's right.
That's right. So I think I think that's the, the, the first thing is the sunlight to really bring the issue home. And I can do a little bit of it, but you know, I think the organized media uh, has to really pick up on it. And then um, I don't know, maybe academia, but the media really that, that's the fastest way. Yeah. They start to, they start to believe this, the message will start to get out there. Mm -hmm. they, and I think one of the biggest problems with the media is the media cares more about ratings than they do about the truth. You know, um, you know, a lot of, you know, you go to different channels and, you know, you could see which ones they're favoring and you can see sometimes things are fabricated and, you know, and uh, really it's, it's confusing because people, you know, when people li listen to the media, whether it's on the internet or it's on TV, if if they if they are uh, loyal to a certain channel, if they say that the sky is black, then the sky is black. If they say the sky is red, the sky is red. You know. But then you know, people in the media, journalists, reporters, they came into into this profession to speak the truth and to make the the, the country a better country. And I think a lot of a lot of the you know, you do have a lot of great journalists out there, but then you have people out there that are more worried about making money and 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 attracting ratings too. So it's 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 a cross, you know. And like you said, you have to really, you know, hope that those leaders out there that really believe in, in speaking the truth and making the, the world a better place, you know, can really speak loud so they can get the message across to more than one circulated area, but get it across on a broad range, a broad audience, which is the whole United States. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think, I mean, you're right about the media. They tend to uh, want to have ratings among a certain population and they'll feed that population what it wants to hear to have them continue to listen by the products and the ratings. So how do you deal with that? Again, I think it's by starting to put a value on balance, mm -hmm. cooperation, however you want to call it. When you start to put a value on that, you've got a chance. Look, I, I grew up a long time ago, older than you and probably most of your viewers um, but um you know the the media wouldn't wouldn't be that even-handed but they wouldn't be destructive of the other side yeah you know they they yes they would they would have an, a perspective and an attitude but it it's gotten so polarized now that you can't you can't come together i think one thing that'd be great for people to do and i i try to do it is to listen to all the media Mm -hmm. to listen to both sides, all three, four, five sides, whatever. I mean, there's so much out there to listen to. Right. And as you start to as you start to listen to more, you really start to you know, the truth is somewhere in between all these. Yes. Things. I think that's that's another way to do it. It's, it has to be it has to be encouraged, and really, the message has to come home to the leaders, the media leaders, the political leaders, and then and then others others will start to follow. Really. This country's great, but it if it makes mistakes, it's vulnerable. And yeah. there are other countries that are just, you know, waiting to take us down. They're yeah. in the survival area still. Right. They're there and they're they like to eat up any other country they can. Yeah. We're pretty Yeah. <laughs> you know, I hate to be like an academic who lays out the problem and doesn't have great solutions. Or if I have them, I can't make them happen by myself. Right. You know? I think your your ideas are 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 very valid and and very beneficial. You know, I think we need to really cooperate as a team because that that teamwork and that that cooperation has kind of left. It's like everybody you know is is at each other's throats, and we need to get to the point where, like you mentioned back when Reagan was president, you know, both sides were working as a team. You know, they might have differences of opinions of what should be important and what should be secondly, you know, on on the second shelf but they worked as a team and they came to compromise and and that's what people have to learn is that it's okay to compromise compromise is a good thing you know it's not about winning or losing it's it's about coming to a constructive compromise that's beneficial that will will benefit everyone in some way or another i think that's it i mean i think shows like yours that's a way this is this is a medium you know podcast world in fact, it's pretty strong nowadays. Yeah. You know, I mean, people people watch it like they watch 
that like they um, binge watch Netflix. Some people yeah. are watching podcasts all day long, and that becomes a source of their information. Their the newspapers are pretty gone, um, and so right now we're right now we're we're part of this. You know, right. We're part of this this hopeful hopefully movement. If people start to crop up in different podcasts, whatever, and starts to have an effect. Now, have you? So it's you. So you're part of it. You can do the solution. <laughs> I can do the solution. I can work on yeah. it. I'll need your help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I would any, love any... to come out with a, with a solution, but we need people like you also who who could actually make people see things on a more realistic you know basis. Sure, I hope so. I mean, I um, I do. I mean, uh, that's that's what I kind of want to leave to uh, the next generation. I'm I'm behind I'm beyond the point where making a lot of money is important. My kids are grown. I don't have to worry that much about uh, immediately about my own needs. Right. And I really I really want to leave this message as as my contribution, my legacy, whatever you want to call it. That's why I'm really happy to be on your show, other shows, whatever. Get the book out and um, try to get this message out. Basically, yeah. it's very simple. Balance, cooperation, compromise, however you want to really characterize it. Yeah. When you when you see, you know, from from a from a um from a psychology point of view, when you see people filled with so much hatred and anger, those people out there that are are, are you know, you have conspiracy theories, you have people that have been brainwashed by, you know, other other people or groups and or they just are, you know, so angry. And, and how do you how do you get people to let go of that anger and to, to and to and to focus and change their perspective to compromise? Because there are so many people out there that are angry and they're resorting to violence and they're, res they're resorting to verbal abuse and they think that they're going to get something positive by doing these things. And how, you know, from your own perspective and from what you've seen and from what you've learned in the course of your years, what's your idea of, of making these people that you see, well, you know, like look at what happened when, when they, when they, you know, invaded in, in Congress, you know, like where, how do you get these people to let go of their anger? Like some of the people who actually got, um, they got, uh, they went to court and they had to go to jail for a little time. They came out and they, they realized, oh my God, what did I do? But it took them, you know, discipline and punishment to come to the realization that, Hey, my behavior wasn't, beneficial it didn't benefit me and it didn't be benefit society but these people who are still out there that haven't had any any type of apprehension or discipline or someone saying hey this isn't right or and and show them you know a way in their head it, it's embedded in their heads right now the anger the hatred and and the acts of violence this is the way to go this is how i'm going to change people's way of looking at things i'm going to force them to be like me how do you how do you make those people change? Okay, you know we're starting to get into a little bit of another topic. Okay, but it's related. But it's related. The question is: what, So we've already talked about why our country is in danger of dissolving, really, mm -hmm. because of this civilization cycle. Things are happening now that would never be tolerated 20, 30, 40 years ago. Right. I'll give you I'll give you an example. RCA, this is a long time ago, 40 years ago, more, mm -hmm. came out with a TV that could record what a family said in its living room. Mm -hmm. That lasted on the market a few months. People would not hear of that, and it was taken off the market. Right. Today, you have uh, these devices that listen to everything we do. Yeah. And people got used to it they don't seem to care and that's that mentality it's not that like they're saying things that are that profound but it's the mentality that yeah okay if everybody knows what you know finally i'll i'll make the compromise sure they can know what i want to watch my tv show so i'll let them know what i'm talking about my living yeah room. what's going on now is our vulnerability is being exploited it's being exploited in ways that aren't that recognized a lot of the dissension that's going on is is not spontaneous, seems spontaneous, but it's it's directed. 
And if you if you can see that, can see what it is, you've got a better chance. Right. So now I'm going to sound a bit, little bit like a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> okay. The Black Lives Matter movement came in. Mm -hmm. The three people that organized it acknowledged that they were trained Marxists. And people kind of let that go. What's a trained Marxist? Well, this is a communist desire going back to the beginnings of Russian and Chinese uh, communism. Mm -hmm. And that is to undermine every other country and make it like theirs. Right. America is a big, America is a big kahuna. <laughs> so initially, the big difference in societies was between the workers and the capitalists. Mm -hmm. However, in a lot of countries, there's there's economic mobility. So you can't really split the society that well on that, but you can yeah. split it on race. Right. That's what's going on today. Everything is race. You're a racist. I'm a racist. I can't help but being a racist. I'm born a racist. I'll die. A racist. Everything. That's that's not a that's not by accident. It's happening. It's getting more widespread because we're vulnerable. We're vulnerable. Mm -hmm. These things these things might have been tried in the 30s and the 60s, but they didn't go that far. Now people yeah. are really they'll really go far. There there are very there are various others that uh, other aspects of this that are going mm -hmm. on. And if if you really want to tie it together, you can watch some videos by a guy named Yuri Bezmenov, B-E-S-M-E-N-O-V, B-E-Z-M-E-N-O-V. He's on, he's an ex-KGB agent who'd, who'd split small countries for the KGB, wow. but he defected to America. And he lays out in his YouTube videos what the goals are, what the techniques are. And if you look at them from that perspective, it ties together together so much of what's going on in this country. Wow. We are really vulnerable. We are really in danger of just collapsing. That's Unfortunately, scary. there's no halfway. It's going to be a waterfall. And then all of us are having a great time right now. And all of a sudden, you know, country's not there as we know it. Yeah. Yeah. So the more, the, again, the more sunlight, the better. Right. And that's where I think it, it breaks down, going back to the more sunlight, the better. The more good leaders that come out and really wake up and shake up the country, the the more these vulnerable, negative vulnerable aspects will maybe somehow turn around and people will see things from a different light. And I, I think that's starting to happen a little bit. You know, people are starting to see things, you know, and realize, you know, wow, you know, this isn't right. You know, this isn't normal. You know, this shouldn't happen in government. And I think some, so we are starting to wake up some people and, you know, people are realizing that this is not the way to go, you know, but I still think we have a, a lot of work to do because we've, we've pivoted, you know, and, and it's going to take some time before we could actually make the road straight again. I agree with you. I think people are starting to wake up, but they don't know how to put it all together right now. That's okay. It'll start to come out. But people have had enough of this internal strife. Yeah. It it doesn't have it doesn't reverse overnight. It didn't happen overnight. It doesn't reverse overnight. But when we see examples of people realizing we shouldn't be a house divided. Right. Then and, and how come we became that way? And you know, how can we avoid it in the future? When people start to question that. That should be picked up on yes. and amplified. And then it, people see it elsewhere in the society. Yeah. That's that sunlight. That's sunlight, the best disinfectant. What I do like is that you notice that you'll even see comedians now getting involved and they will crack jokes, but they're serious, but they're they're making it funny so people pay attention. But yet, in a sense, there's an underlying message that they're trying to get across to people so it sticks in their head and maybe wake you know make puts a couple of light bulbs on in the house yeah i think you're right i mean there's there are good ones and bad ones but the good ones they yeah. do that they comment where nobody else wants to get involved yeah and uh, they use humor as their whoops what did I, okay they use humor as their as their means mm -hmm. right that's fine people can 
laugh, but they go home and they think about it. If you have a big sign that says do something or other, nah, you let it go. But when it, you know, humor reaches your heart. Yeah. To make someone laugh is, is you've given them some pleasure. That's meaningful. You've created a relationship with your audience. If you're the comedian or with the, the comedian, if you're the audience. Right. And, and so you're, you know, they, they can bring home these thoughts more easily because of that. Right. Humor, humor is one of the best techniques. It's hard to do it in an organized way because a lot of comedians maybe aren't that organized. But right. <laughs> when they hit it right, people know they hit it right. Right. They know they hit it, you know, and it makes people think. That's, That's very true. Like, when they start to think. Now, tell me a little about your book because I want to hear more about your book. Okay. So um, the book Path to Political Peace has to do with a lot of what I've said. First, it lays out this underlying difference that it's genetic and it's between survival functions outside the nest and reproductive functions inside the nest. And that's the war. It then starts to look at the various issues of society. I meant, meant, mentioned a couple of them, but yeah. it starts to realize that the left and right, the issues are clumped in, in terms of survival on one side and reproduction on the other. So then they'll start to hopefully believe that there's something to this. They start yeah. to see it. That's the beginning of sunlight. Then I translate it into civilization to make it a bigger picture. But really, right. I'm happy to look at with what's going on now, that there has to be a value on balance. Right. The more that is, the more we've got a chance of achieving it. Doesn't yes. mean right. It doesn't mean that it's all certainly it doesn't mean it's all way in one way or the other. And it doesn't mean everything's kumbaya either. Mm -hmm. But but it, it it just means that there's a value placed on teamwork, compromise, cooperation, balance. You can say it in so many different ways, but mm -hmm. we we all get it. But right. It has to be strengthened. That's that's really the message of the book. That's the path to political peace. Sunlight. I think that it's so important for people to to read a book like that because I really think people really need to understand that we need cooperation, we need peace, we need in order we need to be able to work as a team, you know. And if we're going to strengthen our country and we're if we're going to be one of the great countries and strong countries that remain like that, we need to cooperate and and be adjoined as one and not go in different directions because once the puzzle gets messed up you know, you don't have a puzzle anymore and you just have Very a bunch of pieces. Very hard to put it back together. Yeah. yeah that's right. A bunch of pieces. Yeah. It's nothing. You're right. I mean, yeah. that's... Go ahead. I mean, no, I think that's the answer. Is That's just, that's where the sunlight has to shine on on the need for, um, for balance, cooperation, teamwork, all these things that people know about. People know. People know what we're talking about. People have been on teams, whether it's, you know, sports teams or... or drama club teams or orchestra right. people know how to cooperate it's just that it's just it's not as valued as it used to be yeah very true where can we find this book has the book launched already or is it about no no launch? the book the book's in process okay. yeah if you want to know about the the this the basics of it that is the this uh inside the nest outside the nest whatever on kindle there's a, a little monograph. I call it the, the primer because it's really pretty quick. And it's called, I gave it a jazzy, juicy title. <laughs> it's called Sex in Politics. I like Sex it. in Politics. So it's not about salacious sex, <laughs> but it's about, <laughs> it's about the rest of sex, which is raising the next generation. Yeah. Which is, which is feeding it, giving it morals, values, strength whatever yes that's you know that's that's what it's about so it has a juicy title people remember that so yeah. i love and, it and that lays it out quickly it's a quick read because it's really a summary right um so i think if people want to you know want a little record of what i've talked about they can get it, get it there uh it doesn't go that far because i haven't developed by that when i wrote it i haven't developed it enough right but um but it's a start to start. 
And when do you, um, do you know that when it will probably be launched or do you have an idea probably when the, the book will be out this year? Well, you know, I hoped it would get out before the election, but um, it's look, looking like not. Okay. It's looking like, it's okay. I mean, I think if, I think if it gets out and if it, if it hits, if people start to look at life this way, um, then there'll be, a, there'll be enough time for discussion and, and a chance to maybe incorporate some of its ideas into reality, into our real lives. Right. And your website, can you tell everybody your website address? Sure. It's, it's melvinlaurie.com. Just my first and last name. Melvin with a Y, like my mother would call me when I misbehaved. Okay. <laughs> the only other people that do that are telemarketers because they don't know. I don't like that name. <laughs> That's so, so funny. Uh, so it's Melvin Lurie and it's L U R I E dot com. That's and, it. And if you had to really give a couple of takeaways, everything that we discussed in this conversation, what would be the main important factors that you'd like to emphasize to the listeners today that you would really want them to constructively keep in their minds so they can really think about what went on in this conversation and the important factors that can be very meaningful if applied to their lives? I think that, that what, you're, what we're missing is the understanding that these repro the reproduction aspects of life, what we, they're having an effect, but we don't recognize them as such. They're harder to recognize yeah. our sense of uh, caring about the vulnerable. Yes, we have it, but people don't, I think, see that it's it's so fundamental to right. our lives. But, you know, then again, it can be, all these things can be um, driven to the ru a ruinous end. That's where balance comes in. Right. You can't all of one thing or all of the other you have to draw the line somewhere and have you know so i think that i think the idea of balance i think that if people use the analogy of the family a lot of times that's used you know in politics and people say well it's different you know country's different from the family it's really not the same thing it's very much the same thing it yeah. might not be wrecked that's very much the same thing if you have an imbalance in a family not good not good right. for the kid not good for either party if you have a value on balance, and cooperation and teamwork, if that's your value, then you have something to, to strive for that's more important than this issue or that issue. Right. I, so that's that, so that was my balance, cooperation, and don't focus so much on what the differences are. Right. Try to see these two come to the middle and value that. That's so important. That's that's great advice. I, I This has been an amazing time. Um, you know, Dr. Luria, I, I thank you so much for coming on this show. I hope you can come back and we can share some more light about some of these topics. Because I think it's very important. You know, we've come to a time in our society where, you know, it's, it's very upsetting when I see what is going on in the political world and even in our society as, as you know, as people um, are you know, reacting in, in such, you know, negative ways, you know, you have so much, pe so many people out there um, that could, could handle these situations in a more productive manner, but yet they're, go about, they're going about it in the wrong way. And, you know, like you said, we need to come to, you know, a, a middle where there is teamwork and we have to come to compromise and we, you know, and it, you know, I think I think you know the more we discuss about it, the more more we shed light on it, the more advice we give, and and maybe waking up people to see if we keep behaving in this way, what is the outcome? It's not going to be a good outcome, and do we want that outcome? Because if we don't, then change needs to be made. Because you know we live in the present, but let's look at the past and let's look at the present right now and think about. If these actions continue, where are we going to be in the next five or 10 years? And we don't, you know, we don't want to see dictatorship in the United States. We don't want to see a country that is, you know, like back in the conservative time when you had the North against the South. There is no reason to have that type of behavior and repeat and repeat ourselves. We should, you know, we should look at our past. We should be proud of who we are and we should learn from our past you know, the good and the bad, 
and use it constructively to build a, a more positive future, you know, and, you know, and you see people taking down statues and you see people taking down, not letting people read books and this and that, but this is part of our, our country. This is part of our history and you can't change history, but we can learn from history and, and we could be proud of the good things that happen and we could learn from the mistakes and we can improve our country by looking at our mistakes and changing it in, in a constructive way, I think. I think you said it better than I could. Thank you. Thank you. It's the message is important no matter who says it. Yeah. So yeah, I think you really put it out there. Yeah, I uh, I really enjoyed having you on the show. You brought up a topic that we don't, you know, talk about too much, but it needs to be talked about more. And I'm so glad that you're writing this book. I'm so glad that you have your website up. And I'm so glad that you're doing these talks and really bring shed in some light. And, you know, it really needs to be emphasized more because, you know, people like you who are shedding, you know, and, and shedding light, like you said, you know, we we may wake up some some minds and we actually may encourage some leadership to be even more aggressive with their messages. And hopefully, you know, talks like this will will instigate that. Yeah, I hope so. It's one step at a time. Many one, steps. But, yeah. Baby but no steps. backtracking. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Well, Dr. Yeah. Lore, I, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for being on the show. And I hope to see you in the future. Well, likewise, it's really been fun for me, and I hope it's been fun for your audience. Well, it's so, definitely been fun for me, and I'm yeah. sure they had as much fun as we did. So thank you so okay. much. You have a great day. Sure. Okay, you too. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.